Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 71st edition of Airhex TV. So let's start with the questions. And uh, before we start, there is a workshop on the horizon. Micro profile with Quarkus and micro frontends with web components. And interestingly, both workshops were sold out and now we got a larger room. So um, there's a, a little bit larger. So uh, if you would like to attend, uh, register soon. So this is around the corner, it's March, this is in the spring. Um, what also happened, there are a couple of new episodes were released. So there is one with an Airhex alumni, uh, Robert Brem, about uh, maintainability, um, um, ab about maintainability of backends, and um, and interestingly, about the uh, new JavaFX in, pa in in particular, JavaFX together with uh, GraalVM, and we had a chat with Johan Voss. And um, so what's, uh, what happened is uh, JavaFX supports uh, Graal. And what this means is we could actually use JavaFX instead of Ionic or, on, or React Native or Flutter, which, uh, which is uh, a really good choice or interesting uh, choice for or option for Java developers. So I don't think the JavaFX, uh, um, um, how to call it, um, you know, is, uh, could be used instead of uh, HTML or, or web components, so more like you know the JavaFX competes with uh, with a native-like framework. So this would be the natural use case for JavaFX. And what you can do with JavaFX instead of um, uh, as opposed to, uh, to 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 web clients is that with JavaFX you have also access to all the sensors, and which is uh, harder to do with pure web. So um, this is interesting. Now another. Um, another uh, episode was about web components and front ends. Um, so that was also interesting take from Robert. And uh, what we also had a um, J groups. This is actually one of the really interesting communication libraries. How to communicate between uh, microservices is um, it works with UDP and uh, reliable UDP. And I had a chat with uh, Bella Ban. Well, which I really enjoyed a lot. So actually, we wanted to do it uh, last year, but there was um, yeah, um, we we postponed it one year later. And the interesting part is this: J groups is the is the backbone of uh, most of the clustering solutions, like for instance in Finispan. And uh, the recent this was from I think yesterday was released. This episode is the, um, the uh, Mozilla Developer Network first approach. A chat with Matthias Reining about um, how to build products with web components. So we had also an episode about backends. So that's basically all. So now let's start with the content. And um, so uh, predictions. So first, um, what I'm, I'm writing is once a year. Predictions, why I'm doing this? Because I get the questions, you know, constantly, what about, uh, what's, what's my take on uh, the current infrastructure? And uh, first, um, the point number one, I did a little bit longer because I explained what actually happened. So, and this is possible since, since uh, 2016. So, the uh, Docker container um, separates, you know, the infrastructure, the uh, st stable infrastructure from Fluent Business Logic, and uh, Java E and Jakarta E servers just fit perfectly into it. And uh, what it means is, um, actually, today I'm uh, after a workshop where. We talk, you know, what the future of a monolith could be, how, how to deal with that. And what we probably will do is we will package the monolith to an application server and ship it to Kubernetes, done. So um, this is a story on over, over and again that this is um, very easy to take existing workloads and package them or wrap them with application servers and use cloud native or cloud native by accident deployment. What I mean by that is you ship the application server once and then uh, daily, several times a day, you can ship your small deployable. Also, what happened is um, that uh, all recent uh, runtimes um, they also strictly separating the uh, the infrastructure from the uh, from the business logic. So what it means is we have instead of a war, we have a couple of jars which can be put into a base layer in one specific jar with the business logic. So we have the same movement in the in the uh, microprofile world, and I would expect as uh, as being a standard. So this doesn't make sense. To you know to ship the entire infrastructure if only a few kilobytes change. So um and uh, I would say the 2019 is the year of Quarkus. So this was I think this is one of the uh, most how to call it 
quickly growing uh, or, or, or fancy or, yeah, the popularity of Quarkus was uh, unique in 2019 from zero to uh, to something which is known in on over every project. Everyone asked me about Quarkus and uh, I, th I think 2020 is going even more successful for Quarkus. I use Quarkus also in, uh, in, in several projects, so we have some Quarkus questions a little bit later, so I'll come back to it. And um, uh, what I also see, private clouds getting more and more popular in smaller companies and uh, yeah, and if the company is too large, you know, the strategy is always driven by uh, some management decisions. But uh, I would say, in a smaller uh, smaller um, companies, I see the uh, you know the uh, curiosity about private clouds. And uh, what I think will happen is like commodity workloads will run on premise or in colocation, and uh, specific stuff you can go to a cloud, like transcription service, image recognition service, stuff like that. So JavaFix, we had uh, a talk about that. And what also happened is, uh, there's not in Java land rather than in JavaScript land. So we had ES6 modules support, which uh, which is uh, sub, um, available in all browsers. And uh, Node.js will also ship with ES6 module uh, support. What it means is, I guess um, uh, there were more and more libraries which will use native ES6 support. So the transpilation in JavaScript land is going to be a little bit less crazy and we could even get in 2020 first libraries with native ES6 module support. So what it means is we could use the libraries as they are without any uh, NPM builds and use them in browser. So uh, Edge is, is, is available. So now we, all browsers understand web components. So you know web standards rule. And uh, Apple Music also web client is uh, built on uh, web components, which is remarkable. SAP announced uh, on the keynote that they are using web standards more and more. We have uh, Vadin with web components. Dojo Toolkit even ships with web components. So everyone loves lo web components. And uh, I also like web components, so it's good. Micro frontends could be also the hype you know, topic for 2020, which uh, basically, on, and, 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 and thinking about micro frontends, which are very like uh, similar to to uh, microservices for frontends. I think that um, with uh, web components is the way to go because they are framework agnostic. If you will try to build it you now with uh, frameworks, you will end up having multiple frameworks sitting in a single page, which would be too slow. Function as a service, I think hype is over. You can use it if you need it. Otherwise, it uh, doesn't make any sense to use it. I hope that Apache Pulsar and Apache Kafka are going to be used as they're supposed to be, as a more as a database than a communication medium. Whitefly 19 ships with microprofile, big news. So all server supports microprofile, and I think GraalVM popularity will grow because uh, yeah, everyone loves GraalVM. So this was uh, just feedback, and um, I got already some tweets, and what I would like to mention is, this is are just my observations, and whether this will happen or not, it really depends also on fashion, you know. Um, the software industry is not a, a lot. There's a, should be actually logical, but it's not entirely logical. There's also a uh, a sense of, of fashion, you know, um, what's what's fashionable this year. So, first, the Robert Nestroy, and I think Robert is a recurring guest on the show, asking what would you wish, what you wish to see as a new feature in the next versions of JPA in JaxOS. I think um, JaxOS there could be a little bit more conventions. So what it's, 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 I mean, it's really hard to uh, to invent something because it's uh, already complete. But in uh, JaxOS, um, I would say probably um, there is a sub resource locator. So what we could use is to uh, to have um, sub resource locators, um, injectable sub resource locators uh, by by CDI. So um, I think this is not so, still not sorted out. And JPA would be injectable entity manager, but um, this is going to be a little bit less relevant because Quarkus comes with Panache, where we don't even see the entity manager. And uh, I think JaxRS, I really like JaxRS. So it's really hard to invent something. And if you have, you have, we have the same problem with CDI. I don't think there are lots of uh, features on the horizon. By the way, uh, if you're interested in the features, we had Jakarta EE, Jakarta EE live stream conference in September. And there were talks about uh, fit JaxRS and, and upcoming uh, JPA features. So, but there are minor features, nothing revolutionary. Um, so, uh, Mr. C 
C. Sevsky ask me in a scenario of an overgrowing ever growing database should binary files be stored in the database alongside the other data of the application when the growth is mainly caused by the binary data and I don't think so this is a good idea so we already had some problems with binary data in and, and relational databases um, so binary data is like it really depends on the database right so uh, there are uh, but uh, usually it's a bad idea to keep binary data in the in a database, uh, data, you cannot query the data, you cannot index the data, it's just a blob which sits somewhere. So of course, um, there are some tricks in relation, you can tell some of the relational databases to maintain the binary data outside. But um, you could have a hybrid where you could store in a relational data, relational data, the metadata and the blob somewhere else. So this uh, works usually better. So Mr. Rakmon, Cookie asked me, I'm new in Java, Jakarta, still learning, and now I'm currently learning about transactions. So uh, first, transactions are incredibly easy in Jakarta. -E. Think about our transaction about thread. Um, if you hit the server first, uh, the server will open the transaction if you see it stateless the very first time. So think about that. If you put stateless on a class, all methods are trans transactional. So what it means is, even before the method starts, the transaction is going to be started, or the method is called, the transaction is going to be started by so-called interceptor. And after the method, transaction is going to be committed, except uh, exception happens. And uh, this is how it is. Now, what is the relation to database? Not a relation at all, because not every method has to use a GDBC connection. So the GDB connection connection is the actual thing. So in one point of time, if you would use in a method a GDBC connection, the relation, the um, transaction from the application server, so at the end of a method, let's assume, let's say this scene, so this line is a method. So what it means here, the transaction would be started here and end it here. So if this method is successful, so no runtime exception will happen, the transaction is going to be committed. If to, uh, if uh, if a runtime transaction happen, it's going to be rolled back. So it means at this point of time, uh, the uh, the JDBC connection is going to be committed or rolled back. Uh, if you're using Entity Manager, a little bit more complicated because uh, we don't know how it is configured. Usually it means uh, on Entity Manager, if uh, the transaction commits, the data is flushed first to database and then the transaction committed. And if the database is, uh, if the entity manager is rolled back, and uh, um, so what usually means the cache is just cleared or the entity manager is just cleared. I hope it was crystal clear. Um, so it's just, yeah, you have to, so think about that. The application server tries to be lazy and it will just wait until it knows whether the transaction commits or rollbacks. And then when the application server knows, then it goes to the resources and commits or rollbacks the transactions. Next question is, um, he asked me, but uh, I mentioned on a YouTube, on a conference, about JSONB and DTOs. And what I mentioned is, uh, what I mentioned is, um, I've seen a pattern DTO. A lot of comments in Stack Overflow I found where, where to, I found where to use DTOs as well are great benefit. I don't understand the concept of them. So um, what I see is you don't understand the concept of DTOs. No one understands the concept of DTOs because they were used, uh, right now they are used just as a fashion. So uh, there is um, usually, what you can do, you can you, if you have an entity, you can you can just return the entity from the backend and what happens then is the entity be, entity, be, entity is going to be automati automatically translated to a JSON with technology called JSON B, and this is uh, this. So it means the data from the entity becomes a, a data transfer object. So we get the copy from the data without having an, an explicit DTO. And the same could be is possible. What I probably mentioned at the conference was JSON P. It's not B rather than P. And then you would have to create a, a hash map like object. So if you search on my blog, you will find a lot of examples for JSON P on JSON B. And um, hash map like object, which is serialized to uh, to uh, to JSON again. And what I did uh, prior Java 8, I returned a method or I implemented a method called to JSON. And this method returned a JSON object. And inside the method, I, I, I just used all the private fields from an entity to create a JSON P object. Nice. 
I hope it is crystal clear. And uh, the classic DTO means, um, for unknown reasons, let's say, I have Java classes which are not uh, transfer transferable over the network, so they are not serializable or, ex or externalizable. So you are copying, you have to copy the data from the Java classes to a serializable DTO in order to be to be transported. So think about DTO as a probably a I don't know a, a truck or a container shipping container on a ship where you can move data around. So this will be DTO. And um, in 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 recent also in some projects what they are doing um, they are just using DTOs which are identical to entities which are actually transferable, and then this is pointless because you're just copying data back and forth without any benefit. And this, if you if you are curious, search for don't repeat yourself, the dry pattern. And what it means is the truth should be in in on, on in one place, not everywhere. So Ulrich, Ulrich Zech is also a, 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 a friend of the show, and I think Ulrich already attended Airhex. If not, I know Ulrich from one of my projects, so a long time ago. And he has an organizational questions. I develop a Java application and have additional libraries, Jackson, Jersey, bin validations, Hibernate validator, Eclipse link, and so forth. What strikes me is if you have such libraries, um, usually they sit on the server. You don't have to ship them with the application server. So um, uh, mainly through transitive dependencies. Uh, yeah. So this is what I don't get because uh, let's say uh, Jackson would be hidden by application server. Application server may use Jackson, uh, like for instance Quarkus, but you you won't see this. And Jersey Jersey bin validation is the same. How can I find out which license these libraries are? Uh, uh, which uh, yeah, which license they 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 have or they are? And um, what I actually implemented is wait, wait a second. This is my blog, and um, I implemented a, a tool called Explorer, and this is, was tool for implemented for similar reasons. The difference is that what the Explorer does. Um, if you if you if you launch Explorer and point it to a jar, it will just extract the uh, version, the the Maven coordinates. And I'm not sure whether the uh, the libraries are are uh, sorry, of the license is also packaged with the jars. Usually it is not. But what you what you get is you get the coordinates the uh, Maven coordinates, and with that you can search for the libraries and you will find the libraries usually on GitHub, Maven and then GitHub, uh, and then you can find out which li license it is. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why I don't like external libraries. I just try to use whatever the server provides me and I don't like to bother with that. And I have no idea whether this legal page is a, is a good idea. I'm not a lawyer. What I usually do is what happens if I perform a code review I, uh, I I I I have a list of all of all uh, libraries with issues and also libraries with uh, licensing issues, and my clients have to decide what to do with that. So I have really no idea uh, how to deal with licenses, or uh, I mean, uh, there are lots of corner cases. It's really hard to tell. Sorry. <laughs> now Tunji Dir, uh, also friend of the show, so he uh, he already. Uh, ask a lot of questions. He asked me migrating to GDK and NAS1. So the, 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 the question is, NAS1 was available in GDK 1.8, now it's complicated what to do. And uh, I'm uh, considering right now to moving to Graal, uh, uh, to Graal and to um, to use in, um, you can use uh, Java and JavaScript together in the Graal VM. Um, maybe I will record a video, but this is really trivial. It's like hello world Graal with, uh, with uh, JavaScript. And um, so uh, this is deprecated, so it means you can keep using this. And one point of time, it will disappear, and then you can use move to Graal. And what Graal also has, it it comes with NAS1 compatibility layer, so you can use the Graal VM with NAS1. So I would just use that. Um, yeah, this is what you could do. Now, Voiza says the following. Uh, I have seen videos using boundary control entity pattern, and uh, and and you read something and boundary boundary only is used as an interface that users can communicate through it. Yes, control is used as business logic. Yes, and uh, can link boundary entity. Yes, uh, the entity can be used by control or by boundary. Doesn't matter. 
Yes, you understood it correctly. So boundary is like the boundary to the outside world. Control is like uh, business logic, but control are optional. So it means if you had a CRUD uh, applications, create, read, update, delete, master data management. So you could end up having a boundary with injected entity manager and an entity and you are done. So it means that boundary should not do business logic. No, it means... Uh, boundary does so the perfect boundary would be just facade which coordinates you know between controls this would be the perfect boundary in real world th um, there are some boundaries where they have nothing to do just to delegate to entity manager in this particular case you could have an, an boundary without any uh, any business logic let's say a boundary resource post would do entity manager persist put would do merge and find uh, would do uh, entity manager find so get would be do do find and this would be boundary without uh, business logic and also without a control and uh, the typical case would be you implement a boundary it is the boundary gets more and more complex and then it is too complex so your decision would be i would like to introduce controls you introduce the controls and then the boundary becomes thinner exactly so it means that boundary should not do business logic in your videos you when you use your DAOs. So I only use data access objects in case the access to something is significant hard, significantly hard. So what it means, it doesn't make sense to use DAOs to, uh, to access Entity Manager or JPA, but it makes perfect sense uh, to use DAOs to access, let's say, uh, GNDI or LDAP, which is, uh, we know there are lots of transactions to catch, and this is a non-trivial piece of business logic, so I, will, I would use DAOs, how they were actually defined. So if you search for uh, J2E patents DAO, you will find the old definitions from Sun and from Oracle. So, uh, and classes to get entities from the B in the Y, so shouldn't be placed in control? Oh, um, yeah, DAOs are controls, but I don't call them DAOs. I control the, in, in my case, the controls are just objects like, let's say, uh, invoice finder. And this invoice finder would go to the entity manager and provide me invoices. No one cares whether this is DAO or not. So in my examples, hopefully, DAOs are just objects which interact with um, with database. And if you have something specific and problematic, let's say I will have to call, you know, uh, a GNI code which uses assembler to interact with the I don't know Linux kernel, then I will use a DAO. This would be like the idea. Okay. The next, uh, and for exceptions, the application-specific exceptions, in, the, in, the, in what package BCE should be placed? Also very simple. The simple answer is treat exception as objects, done. So this is, uh, but uh, in, in concrete, what it mean is? What it means is, if the boundary, let's say, we have a boundary invoice, and there's exception invoice to highs exception. So um, now, now the question is where the invoice to high exception belongs. I would say to boundary. But if the system is too complex, it could happen that uh, we have domain-driven design and the entities have business logic and state. And then the exception could be actually thrown by an entity. And in some cases, let's say you have a control which computes uh, fat tax, value-added tax, and the boundary uses the control to order something. So this control could throw, you know, uh, tax uh, underflow or overflow exception. So... Um, Treat exception as objects. So if the exception belongs to entity, it is in the entity package. So I would say this boundary control entities is just remembering the old days how we uh, were supposed to use object-oriented uh, design or, or programming. But now no one would like to hear about object-oriented programming. So we have domain-driven design and whatever. But uh, the idea is to BCE focus on business and name everything after business. RMH78 says, Adam, two questions from my side. Do you have any missing feature in the Quarkus framework? Uh, no. Uh, Quarkus is um, fairly complete. It comes with constraints uh, caused by GraalVM. But amazingly, uh, most of my clients just, I, I think for fun, so they tried to migrate to Quarkus and it worked easier than actually expected. And some are actually running Quarkus right now. And uh, so what could be um, easily done with Quarkus, for instance, what I don't like in Quarkus right now is this application.property should be actually MP, uh, MP config from my, my micro profile. I would rename that. The next thing is what I don't like is that you have annotated all the classes. So um, 
uh, but this is yeah, given by, uh, by 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 Graal. And in Jaxrs, there's also some corner cases where uh, a st stock uh, application servers uh, are a little bit more convenient to use uh, um, than Quarkus. But the Quarkus um, comes with significant memory, uh, I would say, um, savings. So for me, it is just absolutely okay to have you know some workarounds to have uh, extraordinary benefits in memory. So uh, for years, I was thought you know the application servers are too uh, too big, and now it's over. Now we have application servers which are smaller than Node.js. So what it means is actually in 2020, Quarkus should explode. So <laughs> so for which requirements do you uh, you you will still prefer using? A classic Java e application server and not Quarkus. Shared deployments, for instance, right? So there could be uh, still applications which uh, need, for unknown reasons, uh, let's say, a uh, something like a sidecar. And uh, interestingly, uh, soon there will be um, a, a episode uh, on my uh, AXFM pod uh, podcast about using OSGI on application servers uh, to save memory because Kubernetes is uh, too big. So <laughs> this this will be interesting. So I think there could be um, there could be some some uh, cases where application servers are are more interesting than Quarkus. Also, um, of course, Quarkus doesn't come with. Oh, of course, I'm uh, think right now Quarkus doesn't support Java server pages. So uh, in one project we have to migrate, or I was asked, you know, what to do if we have GSPs and servlets. So Quarkus does not provide this right now, and um, and having. Also, so what I also do, I, I, I coach some startups and they have Whitefly and Payara and they are so happy with them that they are absolutely not interested in using uh, Quarkus. They say, okay, they are just, you know, fast and Quarkus is nice, but there is no reason to use it. It's exactly the same as you. If you have a car and a nice car and someone offers you a Ferrari, it's just, uh, I mean, it's okay, uh, Ferrari is nice, but, you know, if I just go shopping with my car, I don't care about Ferrari. So this would be my answer. So if you are happy with application servers, there's no reason to migrate. If you start a new project, um, just take a look on Quarkus. Um, it's an interesting new technology. Cristobal Morales, Morales M. Hola, Adam. So, hola means uh, from Spain, I guess. In a Quarkus project, can I only use Quarkus extensions? If not, which Maven dependence could I include and which not? You can use you can use whatever you like. So, in some project, we use you no know, legacy dependencies, and it worked. The problem is you you were not able to translate the um, the uh, Quarkus bytecode or Java bytecode to native Graal VM code. So this will happen. So if you are interested in uh, having a native image, you will have to use extensions. On what extensions are there are like uh, dependencies which comprise two parts. Like uh, this is a build step. This is the the deployment part and runtime part. And the deployment run, runs at deployment and exposes whatever um, all the metadata about the plugin. And in in order, or in the hope that uh, the Quarkus will optimize everything for you and pass the information on GraalVM. And the runtime part is just a runtime part. And by the way, uh, one simple thing, um, Harald, also, um, now, now I remember something. So if you use, for instance, uh, you cannot use the Quarkus extensions for system tests. So I recorded yesterday a video about Quarkus system testing, so um, it comes. You have to use Quarkus test um, annotations, and then it works. But you cannot use stock uh, Quarkus JaxRS client for uh, and using system test JaxRS client because there is no reflection. So a regular unit test doesn't know what to do with the extensions from Quarkus and only just sees the bytecode. So and I think we are done. Yes, we are. So are there any questions in the no no questions? Here, there are also no questions, and we have um, the old friend of the show, or old young uh, friend from the show, um, Brett Tucker from Utah, I think, USA. He was at Airhex, I think, three years ago, something. If we are just building and launching a small API service, do you just recommend Quarkus these days? <laughs> it's amazing, right? Yes, uh, I would recommend Quarkus these days. Why? So, um, so I, I said for years, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, the memory consumption of Whitefly, Payara is just, they are just small enough. But the problem is, you no, know, I get the question all the time. So what I do right now with Quarkus is exactly what I did five years ago with DAO pattern. So um, short story. Um, I would say five to seven years ago, if you started a project without a DAO, 
uh, people will call you crazy. So in every project, people ask me, why are you not using DAOs? And there was huge discussion of DAOs, what happens if, when JPA disappears? Uh, then DAOs could, you know, abstract the JPA. On, and, and, and this is unclean to have dependencies to JPA, whatever. So, um, and this is called uh, Parkinson Law of Triviality. So there is a Parkinson Law of Triviality, one of the funniest triviality. And if you search for that, there is an... Uh, Wikipedia article and it says you know the more trivial the question the more expensive the answer so this is basically the law the law so you have uh, read it is really fun by the way we should have a section at AX TV you know uh, the uh, law of the day or something like this but this is uh, a good one and um, and with the uh, DAOs what I did before they started asking me about DAOs I created my own DAO and I think it should be Adam being DAO. Let's let's see. So, and this was my DAO. And this was when was it? T Eleven years ago. So look at that. And this DAO, if you look at that, it did absolutely nothing. So this was just a CRUD service bin. By the way, I had to use interfaces back then because it was Java A5. And uh, if you look at this, this is, this is pointless. So uh, what it does is delete is remove and update is merge. And it just, just was a wrapper. So what I did, I introduced the DAO in a project. And after you know everything settled and after a few iterations, I deleted my own DAO and there were no questions asked. And we basically saved a lot of iterations you know, talking about DAOs uh, in, in meetings. And this was my hack. So with Quarkus, I have similar strategy. So what I do in my projects is that before they're asking me you now memory consumption of application servers and whether you should use Go or Assembler to implement uh, Hello World Java, I just show them. The very first thing is I launch Quarkus in dev mode, I compile it to Java, start activity monitor, show the memory consumption, then do native image, show that the native image starts in 0 to 10 milliseconds. <laughs> then, then show you know the 10 megabyte memory consumption and I say, okay, done, done, and then I could use Whitefly, Pyara, whatever I like. There are no questions asked and everyone is not happy probably, but um, we saved a lot of time. So this is one of the reasons. But um, to you, Brett, uh, you are I know you. So yes, just go with Quarkus. I think it's a good idea. And the benefit of Quarkus, it also comes with a lot of extensions which are not part of Jakarta. So there is like, you know, there is this um, open ID connect. I think this OAuth flow, flow, uh, flow, flow, <laughs> flow. <laughs> then uh, uh, Camel libraries and Cogito. So there's lots of interesting st stuff happens in Quarkus, which um, yeah, so which makes also interesting for productivity. And um, small things, for instance, Quarku also, Quarkus also comes with built-in HTTP server, and with one single uh, with one single um, property, course you can activate course. You don't have to ship, you know, your own. A course filter and the course works is, is really nice so um yeah so there are benefits of using quarkus so yeah brett use quarkus and next month next month i will ask you about your progress so i hope we are done right now yes and um perfect so um thank you for watching the show See you at upcoming conferences, airhex.com. And um, so we are, we have lightweight frontends. Watch the title. Supersonic backends, right? Perfect. Lightweight micro frontends. I forgot the micro, so I will extend it. And supersonic backends. So see you in, what is the next show? In, uh, in March. So almost in spring. Okay, thank you and bye.